Good morning and thank you all for joining us for the H1 2024 results call. And today I'll be joined by our CFO, Nivi Bagat, and our COO, Olivier Sevilla. So as anticipated, the demand environment began to show some signs of improvement in Q2, most notably in North America. Globally, clients continue to prioritize efficiency through cost transformation programs, and the demand for discretionary deals remained relatively tamed. Revenues in H1 stand at 11 billion 138 million euros, so down 2.6% at constant exchange rate. And as previously stated, Q1 proved to be the trough and revenue growth rate improved in Q2, coming at minus 1.9% at constant exchange rate versus minus 3.3% in Q1. Bookings totaled 11 billion 793 euros million euros in H1, leading to a book-to-bill ratio of 1.06 for the period. The booking trend also improved in Q2. The book-to-bill in Q2 was 1.09, which is above historical average, and reflects that there is still ongoing robust commercial momentum. The H1 operating margin is stable at 12.4% year-on-year, and the continued shift in the Capgemini's mix of offering towards more innovative and value-added services, leading to an increase of our gross margin, illustrating the strength of our positioning. Organic free cash flow generation also improved. It amounted to 163 million euros in H1, up to 116 million euros year on year. And finally, the normalized EPS is up by 1% year on year to 5.88 euros. So overall, in an environment that remains soft throughout the half year, as anticipated, the group demonstrated the resilience of its operating performance. <clears throat> now, looking at Q2, our growth is trending in the right direction in almost all businesses, sectors, and regions. Just looking a bit in more detail, from a geographic perspective, the recovery is particularly visible in North America, with a revenue contraction limited to minus 3.7% in Q2, comparing this to minus 7.1% posted in Q1. With growth rate either stabilizing or improving, Europe continues to demonstrate more resilience with minus 2.5% in the UK and Ireland and minus 2.7% in France and a slight growth at 0.4% in the rest of Europe. Improvement is also visible in six of our seven sectors. Olivier will further comment on this. And finally, all our businesses also posted better growth rates in Q2. Our 3.7% growth in our consulting business strategy and transformation stands out. It reflects the client demand for strategic consulting on their transition towards a digital and sustainable model and supplemented also by the growing interest in exploring the broad GNI opportunity. And our positioning with clients as their business and technology partner is more strategic and comprehensive than ever. So let's jump now and address the update to the outlook. So we are on the recovery path, but the slope is slower than what we expected, and this is leading us to revise our growth outlook for the full year. First, we do not count on any return is discretionary spent at all this year. And recent development are impacting our two largest sectors. First, within manufacturing, the aerospace has abruptly turned from an investing to a tightening phase, driven normally, notably by many supply chain issues. And the anticipated slowdown in the auto sector is becoming more abrupt and happening faster than we anticipated. Second, the recovery in financial services is there, but it at a slower pace than initially anticipated at some of our largest clients. In this context, we now aim for a low single-digit constant currency exit rate and target a constant currency growth of minus 0.5% to minus 1.5% for the full year, as compared to 0 to 3% initially. To note is that the M&A impact should be around half a point compared to up to one point on the higher end of the previous guidance. This revised guidance factors as well for a potential slowdown in France. Despite this, we confirm our operating margin and free cash flow targets for the year, which confirm again the group resilience. 
We have increased our investment in go-to-market. Our sales funnel is solid, and all our group resources are fully mobilized around growth, and we are positioned to capture the upturn as the demand environment improves. Now, this is the case, for example, in generative AI, where we are recognized for our leadership and the quality of our services. Generative AI is still driving many client discussion, and we engage in larger programs to deploy use cases at scale, notably through generative AI factories. We are currently working around on 350 ongoing projects, having already delivered hundreds since last year, and we have approx approximately 2,000 deals in the pipeline. But let me highlight a few examples. For Unilever Food Solution, we are customizing and deploying a mobile Gen AI sales conversational uh, AI assistant to help them catering customers identify and buy the best products in line with their recipes and budget, as well as a Gen AI assistant for sales rep on the field to better position and propose the available portfolio of products. With those customers, Gen AI assistant, you need a food solution aim at improving customer retention and expanding their current 3 million customer base in 72 markets. For a global aerospace and defense player, we are setting up a Gen AI factory. During the first phase, we are structuring the AI factory, scoping and prioritizing use cases, deploying the teams and operating model, upgrading the customer's AI technology stack and platforms, and developing MVP to validate some concepts. The second phase is about the development and deployment at scale of AI and Gen AI use cases in defense and aerospace programs. And also for European Ministry, we are defining, developing, and deploying AI, Gen AI use cases for predictive maintenance and infrastructure optimization across defense assets. For example, the deployment of AI and Gen AI use cases enables the extension of the lifespan of assets, optimize the energy consumption, as well as reduce the waste in the supply chain through optimized availability of spare parts. We are well positioned to address the demand for Gen AI. We have scaled our capabilities. We have now trained more than 120,000 employees on Gen AI tools. We have expanded our ecosystem of technology partners, further to the Microsoft, Google, AWS, Salesforce, and Mistral. We have just announced a new partnership with SAP. We are expanding our portfolio of offering to deploy use cases at scale, and we will strengthen our intelligent industry play with new, three new offers coming in the coming weeks. Of course, it's not all about Gen AI. So further to Gen AI, we continue to invest in building the capabilities and solutions to help our clients transition to digital and sustainable economy. And we are ready, of course, to catch up the market upturn that will continue throughout the second half. Let me highlight a few items on the trends we see on the market. We are seeing a momentum in intelligent industry with clients looking for end-to-end -end solution. Demand is mainly driven by reconfiguration of supply chains to make them more resilient and agile. We also have several engagement around industrial ramp-ups to help factories deliver products with a fast-growing demand. And we are ready to assist our clients thanks to our end-to-end -end model and our industry expertise. As stated, AI and Gen AI are a major subject of interest for our clients. Data and cloud are also fueling the transformation, of course, and thanks to our strong partnerships with the world leaders, we have what it takes and are well positioned to help our clients in their journey. Demand for digital calls remains sustained, aligned with the willingness of clients to transform thanks to agile ARPs. And finally, at sustain on sustainability, from net zero strategy to reengineering for sustainable operation and energy transition, we are supporting our clients in that trajectory towards a more digital and sustainable economy thanks to our end-to-end -end model. In all these areas, we are well positioned and recognized by the market. Capgemini is positioned as a leader in a 60 global analyst report in H124, covering all services of our end-to-end -end model. Our ecosystem of partners trust us. We have not only received from them more than 20 global and regional partner awards over H1, but we're also embedding their technology as part of our industry-led solution, which has augmented, of course, the relevance to our clients and the importance of having a healthy ecosystem of industry partners to create value together. 
Let me hand over to Olivier to discuss some of the market dynamics. Thank you, Ayman, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, looking now at our revenues by a sector at constant currency, our revenue growth rate, as I have said, improved in almost all our sectors in Q2 compared to Q1. Ayman already commented on financial services and manufacturing. I will expand a bit on the other uh, sectors. Uh, the public sector proved rather dynamic in Q2, accelerating a bit on Q1. The tech and telco sector improved the most during the past quarter, although uh, remaining still negative, a big improvement, sequentially. Consumer goods and retail is slightly improving, not yet back to positive territory though, and lastly, revenue growth in the energy and utility sector remain in the positive territory. Moving on to the bookings evolution. So Q2 bookings are stable year over year. The book to bill ratio reached 1.09 in Q2, which is above our historical average for a second quarter, and in particular above last year, Q2. A few comments on our sales pipeline evolution and composition. First of all, I would like to insist that we see still very solid tailwinds. Demand remains very dynamic for most of our focused value offers. Intelligent industry and with bad supply chain, it's very hot. Data on AI, including Gen AI, of course, cloud, digital core, and sustainability services are in high demand in this market. Our pipeline of large cost takeout transformation is very high and healthy. We are, of course, focused there on time to conversion. Let's recognize we also have headwinds. Discretionary spend is still under pressure. And as I said, we have a couple of our industry segments of strength that face temporary challenges. Overall, we clearly see in our discussions with business CXOs and through our strategy and transformation business growth that more clients are progressively shifting from cost cutting to business transformation enabled by digital. These are, those are actively planning as we speak to invest in their future competitiveness and our position puts us at the heart of those discussions and preparation activities. Then let me highlight a couple of attractive deals. We have uh, one in Q2. First, uh, we are very proud to have been selected by Michelin as a strategic global partner for their IT-driven business transformation moving forward. This new multi-year major agreement with Michelin takes root in our historical successful joint ERP transformation program, which will now expand into the domains of R&D, manufacturing, supply chain, and customer experience in North America and APAC leveraging our intelligent industry for automotive expertise. Capgemini will offer a global delivery model, which will be business outcomes driven and tightly coupled with Michelin teams across Europe, North America, India, and APAC. As part of our partnership, Capgemini will also provide a new academy for innovation, consulting, and GNI services. The second case, which we are really proud of, uh, the second client is one of the largest multi-brand restaurant retail companies in the US with over $25 billion of global system sales to help enable their objectives of continuous restaurant innovation, distinct brand positioning, and global market expansion. They have enlisted Capgemini to be their long-term strategic partner across digital, marketing, experience, and data. With a world-class technology organization service across the brands, the client aims to increase speed to market by up to 25% and double their digital sales in the next three years, enhanced digital data, cloud, and AI capabilities, and also improve the experience for their guests and franchises. We were selected because of our deep restaurant domain experience, specific industry segment, 
cloud and development assets and credentials based upon our work across 40 plus brands in this particular industry. With that, I am happy to end the meeting. Thank you, Olivier, and good morning, everyone. I am pleased to share with you our H1 2024 performance. As mentioned by Ayman, Capgemini demonstrated its resilience in a macro environment which remains soft. Group revenues reached 11,138 million euros in H1 2024, down minus 2.5% on a reported basis and minus 2.6% at constant currency. Operating margin amounted to 1,384 million euros or 12.4% of revenues, a stable percentage year on year. After other operating expenses, financial and tax expenses, which I will further comment in a moment, the net profit group share reached 835 million euros, up 3% year on year. Normalized EPS reached 5 euros and 88 cents, up 1% year on year. Finally, we generated an organic free cash flow of 163 million euros, up 216 million euros year on year. Moving on to our quarterly revenue growth. As mentioned by Ayman, we have passed the trust in Q1, and revenue growth rates improved in Q2 as expected in all businesses and almost all regions and sectors. On an organic basis, decline in Q2 revenues is limited to minus 2.3% compared with minus 3.6% in Q1. This brings our H1 organic growth to minus 3%. Taking into account the group scope impact, the growth at constant currency is minus 1.9% in Q2 compared with minus 3.3% in Q1, leading to minus 2.6% for H1 overall. FX became a tailwind in Q2 with a 40 basis point positive impact, leading to a 10 basis point positive impact in H1. As a result, reported growth is minus 1.5% in Q2 and minus 2.5% in H1. At this point, we expect FX to have a neutral impact for the full year 2024. Moving on to revenues by region. After several quarters of continued deceleration, the trajectory of our growth rates evolved favorably in all five regions. As anticipated, North America is the region where growth rates improved the most in Q2. Whereas, in other regions, growth either slightly improved or stabilized. Turning now to H1 revenues at constant currency, revenues in North America region decreased by minus 5.4% year on year. While the TMT sector improved visibly in Q2, the financial services and consumer and retail sectors remained a drag, only partly offset <clears throat> by growth in the manufacturing sector. Revenues in the United Kingdom and Ireland region declined by minus 2.8%, mostly driven by the financial services and consumer goods and retail sectors in spite of solid growth in the energy and utilities and services sectors. Activity in France was down minus 2.7%. Solid momentum in the public sector was more than offset by visible softness in the TMT, manufacturing and financial services sectors. Revenues in the rest of Europe region were virtually stable at minus 0.1%, with a strong momentum in the energy and utilities and public sectors offset by a visible contraction of the TMT sector. Finally, revenues in the Asia-Pacific and Latin America region were down minus 1.6%, mainly driven by the decline of the financial services sector, partly offset by growth of the consumer goods and retail and public sectors. Moving on to our revenues by business. <clears throat> All businesses experienced an improvement of their revenue trends in Q2 when compared to rates reported in Q1. The 3.7% growth in our management consulting business, that is strategy and transformation, stands out and illustrates client demand for strategic consulting in their transition towards a more sustainable and digital model, further supplemented by their growing interest in exploring Gen AI opportunities. Across H1, overall, at constant currency, Total revenues of strategy and transformation services are up 2.7% year-on-year. Total revenues of applications and technology services, which are Capgemini's core business, declined by minus 3.4%. Lastly, operations and engineering total revenues decreased by minus 1.8%. <coughs> Moving on to the headcount evolution. 
Total headcount stands at 336,900 employees at the end of June, down by 4% year-on-year but stable since the end of March 2024. The offshore leverage stands at 57% stable since the end of 2023. Lastly, attrition decelerated further over the past quarter. This brings our last 12-month attrition rate to 15.2%. Moving on to our operating margin by region. As is often the case with half-yearly publications, we experience more fluctuations in regional margin evolution than what we typically do on a full-year basis. So please keep in mind that H1 regional margin evolution does not necessarily provide a full representation of what the full-year evolution will be. Operating margin in North America stands at 15.5%, up 30 basis points year-on-year. UK and Ireland Operating margin amounts to 20.5% compared with 18.4% in H1 last year. Conversely, operating margin in France is down to 9.1% from 11.1% in H1 2023. The rest of Europe operating margin is up to 11.1%, up by 60 basis points year on year. Finally, operating margin in Latin America and Asia Pacific is 10.5%, slightly up from 10.2% in H1 last year. Moving on to the analysis of our operating margin. Overall, the continued shift in Capgemini's mix of offerings towards more innovative and value-added services more than compensated for the inflation impact in H1 2024. This illustrates the resilience of the group's operating model in a soft demand environment. The 50 basis points increase in gross margin, coupled with a nearly stable G&E expense has offset the investment in selling expenses to fuel future growth. Moving on to the next slide. Our net financial result for H1 2024 is an income of 20 million euros as opposed to an expense of 20, 22 million euros in H1 last year. This swing was primarily driven by higher interest income on our cash assets, while our bond debt is entirely at fixed rates. The income tax expense increased by 13 million euros year on year to 326 million euros. Our effective tax rate is almost stable at 28% compared with 27.8% in H1 last year. Let's turn now to the recap of our PNL from an operating margin to net income. The other operating income and expenses are down 25 million euros year on year at 237 million euros mainly driven by lower restructuring and integration costs over the period. Our operating profit is 1,147 million euros or 10.3% of revenues up by 20 basis points year on year. After financial and tax expenses, minority interests and equity affiliates, the group share in net profit amounts to 835 million euros up 3% on H1 2023. Consequently, the basic EPS is up 4% to €4.88, while our normalized EPS reaches €5.88, up 1% year-on-year. Finally, let's have a look at the evolution of our organic free cash flow and net debt. As you know, our cash generation pattern is highly skewed to the second half of the year. We generated an organic free cash flow of €163 million Euros in H1. Therefore, we confirm our target of around 1.9 billion euros for FY 2024, which notably takes into account an increase of our cash tax rate. A few final words on capital allocation. The bolt-on acquisitions closed in H1 translated into a limited net cash outflow. In this context, we increased our returns to shareholders, which reached 905 million euros in H1 2024. This comprises 580 million euros corresponding to the 2023 dividend and 325 million euros net for share buybacks. Consequently, our net debt stands at 2.8 billion euros at the end of H1. This compares with 3.2 billion euros at the end of H1 last year and 2 billion euros at the end of 2023. On this note, I hand back to Ayman for the Q&A session. Well, thank you, Nivi. So let's now open the Q&A and allow, of course, to allow a maximum number of people in the queue to ask questions. May I kindly ask you to restrict yourself to one question and a single follow-up. 
Operator, could you please share the instructions? Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 1 and 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 and 1 again. Please stand by when we compile the Q&A roster. So we will now take the first question from the line of Balaji Tirupati from City. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my question morning. Two from my side. Uh, good morning. Uh, two questions from my side, if I may. Uh, firstly, if you could share more color on the deterioration of the outlook in the automotive and aerospace sector. At this stage, do you see it as a sustained deterioration through second half or more of knee-jerk reaction to uncertainty, uh, increased uncertainty on account of multiple elections in Europe and upcoming elections in the US. And second question on free cash flow side, the cash tax rate was again meaningfully lower. And apologies if I missed uh, if a comment was made on that, but uh, what has driven the lower cash tax rate and, and should we expect some reversal in second half? And what is driving the sustained strong cash conversion in, in the uncertain environment for you? Thank you. Thank you, Varaji. So first on the on the automotive and aero. I, again, you know, look at the picture. On the aerospace sector, of course, the perspectives, the, the mid to long term perspective are extremely good. Uh, as you have seen, there are some challenges coming from the supply chain, where basically, which has which has slowed down the industry in terms of uh, delivery and growth, and as a consequence, they are basically preserving cash and preserving cost. So for me, it's a, it's a, it's an adjustment in the short term. It doesn't change the fact that we are on a, on a booming industry that will uh, basically sustain growth, you know, uh, very strong growth actually in the midterm. So for me, it's an adjustment of supply chain that needs to happen to be able to reaccelerate growth. But in the short term, it does have an impact in terms of, you know, slowing down demand. The automotive sector, I think it's mixed. I think the, the, uh, you know, it's, it's mainly on the, on the European side. The perspectives are less good in the short term. You have seen a slowdown in the EV, which is also slowed down a bit. Some of the investment in the short term in the EV. But again, it does not change the fundamentals of where things are going. So the reality is, yes, we, are, we have, a, I, I don't know if, it's, if you can call that knee jerk reaction. We do have basically some reaction in the short term, which are, I have to be honest, quite abrupt from what we have seen in, in the last two or three weeks that basically take us to become, to take more caution and basically take, take into account what clients are telling us in the short term, at least for this year. Free cash flow, Nivi? Yes. Hi, Balaji. So, Balaji, uh, our H1 cash tax rate is never representative, as you're aware, of the full year. And as I've mentioned earlier, our cash tax rate in 2024 was always meant to be higher than it was going to be in 2023. Now, coming back again to your point on, you know, on, on, on free cash flow generally, uh, I think there are two things to mention here is, yes, we reiterate our guidance of around 1.9 billion euros, and it's important to note that we continue to focus on our DSA, DSO improvement, and of course, with the, uh, with the acceleration will come, of course, our working capital pressures, et cetera, which we will continue to focus on, but nevertheless, um, we believe that the uh, guidance of 1.9 billion euros is a sound one. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Mohammed Muawala from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, morning, I'm in the VA. Good morning. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, firstly, just in terms of this sort of shift in, in the outlook, I'm just curious to understand as you as you think about seasonality um, in the second half, particularly sort of Q2 to Q3, could this still be similar to kind of prior years? And as we think about the exit rate um, being much lower in Q4, how does that sort of shape sort of 2025 in your view? Should we see a more pronounced recovery or simply the visibility is not there yet to kind of um, you know, pass judgment on that? And then secondly, um, as we look at sort of you obviously preserving the margins quite well, how does sort of the, um, you know, this sort of 
change in kind of the revenue outlook and, and the fact that obviously on the headcount, you know, you're still not sort of growing yet, um, play into the shape of the margin uh, for next year? And, and do you still feel comfortable around the kind of 14% guidance you gave as a midterm target? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mo. So for on, the, on, on your question, first on the growth rate. Uh, as, as I said, you know, the recovery is there, so we see things improving. But of course, we had not, uh, you know, we could not anticipate some of the abrupt changes we have seen, you know, in the aerospace uh, and auto sector. And of course, the, the slow down, the, slow, the slower recovery, because there is still recovery and we still expect, you know, positive news by, 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 by Q4 in financial services. It's just the, the, the slope is slower than, than what we'd have expected. And as I did mention, to be frank, we have taken a cautious view on France, okay, in our outlook because of the, 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 you know, the political environment and the implication. We have seen some wait and see attitude uh, in France, and we have to, we have to be cautious about that. Uh, so that's basically what has driven, you know, the, the outlook we have for H2. We still, you know, uh, as I said, expect to be uh, back to low single digit uh, growth by, uh, by, uh, by Q4 in terms of exit rate, which of course put us in a, in a good trajectory going into 2025. But I think at this stage, it would be a bit too early based on the variability of a number of elements in the environment to, to start talking about 2025 in, uh, in more detail. Uh, on the, on the, uh, you also your question around the headcounts and margin. First, the, the headcounts for us are positive right now. So it, start, it has stabilized in, in, um, in, the, in the second quarter, you know, but we have started to see some places where headcounts have started to grow, notably in India. So we, so we are positive on the fact that, you know, the recovery is there and as such, you know, the headcount growth will start to be there. We'll optimize as much as possible, of course, to continue to maintain our discipline around the margin and the operation, but we do expect headcount growth to start to resume, and, and the first signs are really happening in India so far, and there are some other countries as well where we start to see that. So I think I'm, I'm positive around that. On the margin, you know, uh, I still see uh, the possibility to do 14%. Of course, it will depend on the environment for next year, uh, but right now, if you ask me, can we reach the 14% next year? My answer is yes, we still can reach the 14% next year. It can be challenging, but we still can reach the 14% next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Sven Merck from Barclays. Please go ahead. Very good morning. Thank you for taking morning. my questions. Good morning. Um, maybe firstly, can you comment just a bit more around how much visibility you have over the second half um, in terms of growth and perhaps which factors would bring you to the high or low end of the guidance? And can you just confirm that I understood this right? You don't need any return of discretionary spend uh, to achieve the new guidance range. Yeah, I mean, so uh, it's clear. I mean, I did say we don't expect any discretionary spend to return this year, and we, we, we're not counting on it. And as you imagine, we have, we have built some caution basically on that guidance, uh, notably because of the environment and, and, and some of the things that have changed. Uh, so, you know, f for, from my perspective, you know, between, listen, the low end and the high end, yes, there, there, is, there is one point, you know, uh, of, of growth for the full year, so two points in H2, it does factor basically variability that, that we still expect potentially in the environment. Uh, so we have the risk, of course, our guidance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Toby Og from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, morning. Um, morning. Thanks, thanks for the questions. Um, maybe just on, on North America, firstly, um, so that was the region that saw um, a bigger improvement in Q2 versus Q1. Um, did that improve quicker than you'd expected? Uh, and if so, what was the driver? And then just thinking about North America into the second half, what, what's the assumption for how that should evolve, um, particularly given the presence of U.S. elections uh, and any impact that might have on, on decision making. Um, and then just second question on, on the guidance um, 
for 24. Um, could you help us with, with the sort of core kind of macro assumption, demand assumptions bu built into the low end of that? And, and should we be thinking of um, discretion? Would it be fair to think that at the low end, the, the, the assumption around discretionary is that it would deteriorate? Thank you. Yeah, so let, 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 let's start with, uh, with, with North America. You know, we see, we see definitely a positive trend around North America, and I think it will continue, uh, we'll continue to see improvement in Q3 and, uh, and Q4. Nivi did say that one of the elements affecting North, affecting North America uh, is going to be the, um, the, the recovery on, of financial services, which is a bit slower than what we expected, so it will be a bit slower than what we could have anticipated in uh, February, notably. But, but we, we definitely see North America back to positive territory by the, by the end of the year. So, uh, so uh, the, the perspective are good. You saw that the economic growth due to GDP announcement last year was positive. So, you know, we continue to, to, to see a recovery and we count on it for the, for the rest of the year. On the, on the guidance, you know, you know the, the core macro, again, you know, when you revise your guidance, you're going to be cautious. So, uh, so we are cautious on Europe. We have been cool. We are cautious on on some of the manufacturing segment. Again, I have I have to precise that yes, auto and aero uh, are not doing great, but the rest of the manufacturing is is actually growing. So, so but but it's really an inversion. The auto and aero is an inversion compared to what we expected. I mean, we expected to be in full growth in aero for the full year. We we see now a contraction in H2, and and that that's a significant shift. You know that that we have to take into account, and whenever you see something like that, and clients start to abruptly change, you have to be cautioned in it. Uh, so I, I I do not expect you know a better macro. I we we don't see uh, like you say on North America, we don't see a negative impact you know from the election. I think whatever uh, variability uh, has built in our customers. Uh, you know, uh, budgets and forecasts and so on that we see today, it's not going to fundamentally change, you know, unless something very abrupt happens, of course. Uh, so overall, we, we are confident on the, on the, on the, on the guidance uh, that it has factored basically the, the really what could happen uh, overall, including, as I said, in France. Discretionary spend, I don't see a deterioration. I mean, to frank, discretionary spend is at a quite low level Historically, I'm not sure there's much more to cut uh, unless you want to really start uh, basically impacting negatively customer operation. I think the uh, discretionary spend drops below what it is. Uh, I would consider that our customers' operations start to be at risk in terms of, uh, in terms of basically uh, running. So, so I, I do not see deterioration discretionary spend, but again, we're not counting on any improvement. So any improvement would be, uh, how do you say, would be a positive surprise. That's great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Michael Brias from UBS. Please go ahead. Yes. Good morning. Um, in morning. terms of the a, a, a point of sort of clarification, I guess. I mean, when you talk about an exit rate, um, are you talking about a Q4 average or you know December's rate? Because if I put in say Q4, Q4. Rate, I clarify Q4, Mike. But, but that, I mean, the low end would suggest Q3 then is perhaps weaker than Q2. Is is that intentional or is that just a very conservative com, uh, outlook? No, I mean, Q3 will improve, but we are cautious around the level of improvement in Q3. Okay. And then just a question on margins. Um, Obviously, you've, you've revised the, the range for, for revenues. We're halfway through the year. Do you have a feeling on whether you'll be more likely at the bottom or high end of the 2024 margin? And I appreciate, you know, the, the cut to guidance probably means that the bonus pool uh, for the workforce is lower this year than, than budget. It, how much of a headwind might that create to the recovery next year, given uh, the only question about 14% margin? I think we're digging a little, little, little bit too much here. I mean, f first, you know, the bonus pool evolves, uh, you know, with, uh, with the performance for the year. So, I mean, it's every year is the same. So, if next year we have better operating leverage as well, so the bonus pool will improve. But for me, it's not a headwind. 
it's built as part of the economic model. So for you know, you, should, you shouldn't consider it being as a headwind. You know, giving people better bonus when the operation is better is not a headwind for me. Actually, I'd like the operation to be better to give them better bonus. So it, it is built as the economic model whenever we look at it. Um, on the on the lower and higher end of the margin, maybe you want to. Uh, uh, so I think as far as uh, 24 is concerned, we expect that, of course, we will be well within the guidance of 13.3 to 13.6 that we've given. And Michael, as you're aware, there are a number of levers that we work through. So you've seen H1, you've seen that in a softer environment, we've still improved our gross margin by 50 bips. And, and the continued progression we make is based on our revenue mix, as you're aware. And we will continue to focus on various other levers, be it our uh, continued focus on utilization, our GNA, our you know, various other expenses, our pyramid, our offshore, etc. So I think all the levers that we have at hand is something that we continue to focus as we go into uh, tw- you know, the rest of 24 and beyond. But to do the high end of the margin would require a very strong H2 margin because your margins are flat in H1. Is that still possible? Well, yes, it's possible. If not, we'd not keep in the guidance. Of course, you know, uh, we have a range, so we so we, we we stick to our, we stick to our range. But again, the environment, you know, I'll, I'll take an example. If there is softening of environment in France, more more than what we expect, it put pressure on the margin. So that's why we have to keep basically, you know, a, a, a range. We know there is lower labor flexibility. The softening of the market in France basically put a bit of pressure on the margin. So we have to keep that range. Uh, at this stage because uh, uh, we need it in terms of flexibility depending on where the environment shifts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Laurent Doré from Kepler Chevrolet. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, Good morning. My two, my two questions are about uh, the profitability of the group. First one is uh, you have new highs on gross margin, so 26.7%. When you look at um, two or three years from now on this margin uh, level, how much of a further improvement can you do by uh, pushing the mix further up? And my my second question is uh, on on France, uh, 200 bips contraction, which is maybe 50 bips at the group level. Is it reflecting just a drop in demand that had deteriorated the utilization rate and hence easy to fix? Or is there something more structural that took place in the first half in France? Thank you. Laurent, let me answer the France question first and then we can do the other one. So as far as France is concerned, um, uh, yes, the, the deceleration that we had and, and, and the, the lower sort of activity has caused some pressure on the margin. But in H1 particularly, we've also had some one-offs, which we do not expect will be repeated uh, as far as H2 is concerned. But again, as I've, as I've mentioned, Laurent, as is often the case with, of course, with half-yearly publications, we do sometimes experience more fluctuations in regional margin evolution than we would typically do on a full-year basis. And I refer only to regions when I specifically say that. So in this particular case, it's a one-off, uh, set of one-offs, and of course the deceleration that you see particularly. On the second part of the, of the question, um, in terms of the improvement, our, our fundamental lever to improve our margin is based on revenue mix. And that is a focus that we will continue to do. So my expectation is as we move and as we, we continue to provide more value-added offerings to our clients and more value-added work, the expectation is the gross margin will continue to improve. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, for example, you see here we have to beef up our sales because, of course, as the market is slow, we have to put more efforts on sales. So you've seen our sales costs are going up, which is an investment, of course, we're doing. And remember as well that we continue to maintain our investment in, uh, in innovation and new offerings, etc., uh, because we do believe, again, that basically that's what fuels uh, our growth and our margin in the medium to long term. So we we'll continue, even in this kind of environment, to maintain, uh, sustain our strategic investment, you know, while, of course, maintaining the discipline of uh, the margin improvement uh, that we expect to achieve. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laurent. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Frédéric Poulain from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Morning. Uh, when, when we look at um, the, the challenges right now, to, to what degree is pricing a factor? Is, is there any pressure on pricing and, and some competitors uh, trying to discount to, to, to win more business, or it's more structural and, and, and demand from some of your large customers that's, that's uh, driving, the, driving that? And then secondly, on, on the, on the follow-up, I mean, interesting recovery in, in, in strategy and technology. Um, any specific factors are driving that, any specific type of project that resonate, and, and to what degree is, is AI a, a kind of, of contributor of that? Thank you. Hey, listen, I mean, again, when you know that the market is slow, there is, there is challenges. Uh, of course, there is some price pressure. I mean, you cannot say the market slowed down, so there has been price pressure now for a few quarters. There's nothing new. Again, nothing irrational. You know, and to be honest, when, when we see some of the slowdown, it's not at all, at least at some of the customers we, we, we talk about, for example, in aerospace or in things, it's not, it's not at all loss of market share. So our market share is as good or even increasing in some cases, in spite of the fact that, uh, that, that we see some, some of the downturn. But again, yes, the pricing environment is tense, as you might imagine, because everybody's trying to, 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 to fuel growth, but the, again, nothing irrational. And, and of course, we are adjusting uh, and optimizing our cost and productivity to be able to remain competitive while preserving the margin. Um, on strategy and transformation, thank you, because nobody's asking me a question about Gen AI or AI. <laughs> it is, it is, I mean, to thank one, you know, uh, which is what we call our invent business, it has continued to grow through the cycle, which I think uh, is really demonstrating the positioning that we are getting with clients in terms of helping them define their path forward uh, from how to leverage technology uh, to be able to transform towards a digital you know, and sustainable world. And we have picked up definitely around the Gen AI basically wave, and there is a lot of demand on our strategy and transformation coming from Gen AI, which is now you know, moving to what, what we start to call, you know, Gen AI factories, where, where our invent business and strategy and transformation business is core to that, uh, where we start to have basically an engagement, multi-year engagement with clients, and we start to see some of that, which can be five, up to five or even 10 million a year, to basically set up uh, these Gen AI uh, factories and help crunch, start crunching, you know, in a disciplined manner, a whole bunch of use cases. And I think, it's positive because, you know, as you have seen, there have been a Gen AI hype and the hype is coming down because people don't see the benefit as fast. And now we are really able to go through a disciplined process of understanding that if you really want to get value of Gen AI, it's going to be use case by use case with the discipline of developing the model, looking at the business case, basically looking at the implementation plan and the change required and then start scaling up basically the users. So we're getting in the positive phase where we consider, you know, the, the hype around the silver bullet is gone, and now we are really getting in a discipline approach where people are making the right level of investment, putting the right level of attention to really start scaling up, you know, the, the, the impact uh, of Gen AI, and that's what really starts giving the bigger relationship and, and fueling some of the growth that we see in strategy and transformation and will translate as we implement the use cases in the, in the rest of the business. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take the next question from the line of Nushin Najati from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. So morning. Two for me as well. Um, again, on the margin, and I'm sorry for pushing on this, but uh, given the higher demand for consultancy, I mean, strategy and transformation on the back of exploring Gen AI, um, I'm wondering if you see some sort of a headwind for your uh, margins here, um, just because the business mix somehow would shift. And then on the headcount, so we are seeing like some sort of, um, we have seen some decline quarter and quarter for the past couple of quarters, and now we have this stabilization. Um, how should we think of the headcount going forward, and um, what is a healthy attrition rate? 
for this environment? What should we think uh, around this? Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. So, I mean, the strategy and transformation is, uh, is positive on the mix. Huh? It's a quite profitable business. So it is not a business that runs at low margin. Uh, and, and it also helps position us for better value. So typically when we, when we are positioned with a client on, on strategy and transformation, it's actually positioned on much more value-driven type of deals, more outcome-based, and that tends to position us actually for a better pricing environment you know, as, as we start deploying technology. So for us, it's all actually a lead indicator of, of, of better business than basically competing on pure, on pure tech deployment. Uh, which basically, in a certain ways, is much more competitive. On, on, on the account, as I said, you know, we, we start to see a growth in, in India, and, and the demand has increased. So, you know, we are accelerating our 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 uh, uh, recruitment in India. We start to see in some countries as well where we start to see that. We are still cautious in some areas, as you as you might imagine, uh, in terms of in terms of headcount growth, notably in Europe. Uh, but overall. I do expect, you know, headcount goes to start to resume as, as growth starts to resume as well and the environment improves. The attrition rate for the moment is stable. You know, I see for the 12 months it's still coming down, which means, you know, the attrition rate in the quarter is, is pretty low. It's, uh, in frank, is, is really even below sometimes our operating uh, environment. So if it increases a little bit, I think for us it's not, a, it's not necessarily a, a bad sign. So overall, I think the environment will remain good because the market is plentiful of resources right now, and even if there's acceleration in the next two, three, four quarters, we do not expect a, a significant impact of, on attrition rate. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take the last question from the line of Nicolas David from Odo BHF. Please go ahead. Yes. Good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Good morning. I have two, actually. Uh, the first one is regarding your, your, your comment uh, in the U.S., in the banking sector in the U.S., where the recovery is slower than expected. Um, it's kind of a, it's a bit different that from the very bullish comment we've seen from some of uh, your big uh, big peers, notably the Indians. Um, could you help us understand why it's a bit different for you there? Uh, is it because uh, you didn't sign some uh, very, very large deal uh, where the main purpose is to, 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 to to bring cost efficiency for the client, and you're more on the discretionary side and the, and the digital side, um, and also on, on mega deals overall. Um, what do you see on the market, and have you been chasing some of those deals, or and what has been your win ratio on this kind of uh, of mega deals overall? And uh, do you have uh, some uh, nice ramp up uh, going on uh, in the next quarter? And uh, question, second question is more for Nibi. Uh, how sustainable is the Positive financial results you, you, you saw in H1, should we expect that in H2 as well and for the next years? Thank you. Okay, so let, let, let me talk about uh, the, 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 the FS thing. It, you know, FS is a particular sector because it's a sector of large clients. Okay, so the mix of clients is important. And sometimes you're on the positive side because you're on the client that are ramping up faster. Sometimes you are on the on the other side, which, which, which clients which ramp up slower. So typically, you can see differences in the same regions, and we have seen that in the past, where, for example, we were seeing positive in the UK, where some of our competitors were seeing negative, and vice versa. The mix of clients plays a lot. So, you know, we have a bit more unfavorable currently mix of clients in terms of the speed of ramp up and recovery. But again, the re let, let, let's be clear, the recovery is there, but at a slower pace, because probably the mix of clients we have is ramping up somewhat slower, uh, you know, the, the, than that. On the, on the mega diesel, I'll, I'll let uh, Olivier answer around the, what we have in the pipeline and what we see. Yeah. So uh, on, on, the, on the mega deals, depends on what you mean with mega, but let's put it that way. Our, our pipe is uh, all-time high. We could say that that way. It's a good pipe uh, with a good mix of deals we originated and deals which are coming from the market. Uh, the key challenge there is so the pipe is good. Uh, and we've closed some of them in H1 that are starting to fuel uh, H2, but we fuel even further next year. Uh, uh, so it's really about uh, time to conversion. 
which is uh, a bit difficult to predict precisely. But I'm optimistic. Okay, and the no impact on, on this year okay. revenue growth of the type of megabits. Okay, I think your last question was on on France particularly. So clearly, the you know we we are expecting that there will be some sort of reacceleration, and if that reacceleration should happen, that will of course improve the margin driven by better utilization. Um, um, but otherwise, the one-offs that I particularly told you about will not recur in H2. No. But in, again, uh, if, if, you, if you go beyond this year, Nicola, in the, besides the current environment where we are cautious, the mid-term perspective in France, I mean, French companies are doing well, they are globalizing, they are investing, uh, so, so we don't have any concern around the French environment, you know, uh, in the mid-term. But yes, we have caution on, on issue around, around France, uh, because of a bit of a wait and see attitude in the short term. Thank you Thank all. Thank you for the details of, of France. But, but actually, my question was more on the financial results uh, at group level uh, you saw in, uh, in H1, which was positive. Ah, the, fi the financial results? Sorry, can you, can you on yeah, H1? The 20 million, the 20 million positive financial results uh, you saw in H1. Uh, is, uh, linked to the ah, I financial guess. results. Sorry, I, I thought you were talking about France. So the, the, the fact that we have positive financial results in H1. How sustainable is that? Yeah. Well, we, we will continue to be able to sustain it because, as I said, we look at it right from financial results, into like interest, uh, interest, etc. Ah. ah, you mean net financial? Re okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. Sorry, sorry, we <laughs> took some time to understand the question. So, um, so just very clearly, uh, yes, it's positive as far as H1 is concerned, and um, H2, the expectation is, you know, overall we will be fine, but I think there will be some more expense that we will have, of course, from an H2 perspective, because H1 is never necessarily a proxy of what happens from an H2 perspective, but overall, uh, from a FY perspective, we expect to be all right. So, if she's not committing, it's going to be positive for the full year. That's, that's the answer. <laughs> all right. Good Thank, you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we didn't need to put your question right. Sorry. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, look forward to uh, interacting with you in the coming days and weeks.